Thank you very much, Eamon. And uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming along this morning. When I sort of think of those eight weeks of lockdown, which I think we can all remember, it's uh, rather nice to be able to get back together um, with one another and see each other's faces. There are certain problems uh, with Zoom. Now, we were discussing um, just generally commission attendance at events yesterday at the executive committee meeting, and uh, the director of banking uh, said, well, there's no point turning up to regulatory events. They're always incredibly dull, and um, we will just have to try and hope to prove that he is, uh, he is wrong this morning. We shall see. Um, so what, what, what have we had over the last year? It's been an example of a black swan event which has challenged an awful lot of our presumptions about how things actually work, how we do things. And my focus today is going to be on economic matters, how the bailiwick does and must continue to add value to the global economy and the role the Commission seeks to play within that rich and complex tapestry. To start with the obvious, Guernsey is not well adapted to autarky. Its people have always made their living through trade with the world beyond our islands the extraction of granite, the production of tomatoes and flowers, and, of course, acting as a redistribution hub for Bonapartist freight in the early 19th century are all noteworthy examples of how trades and goods historically contributed to Guernsey's well-being. As we moved into the later part of the 20th century, the nature of tra trade changed the bailiwick, as for much of the rest of the world, with trade in services becoming rather more important than trade in goods. Given that the bailiwick had, through Protocol 3 of the UK's Treaty of Accession to the European Union, locked into a very fixed arrangement optimised for trading goods, this left the bailiwick in a rather individualist position and a disadvantageous one for about 46 years. I say this on the basis that the EU, during the UK's membership, negotiated trade deals which had both services and goods components. So, in summary, Protocol 3 meant that Guernsey could not benefit from any global lowering of barriers to trade and services, which were negotiated by the EU with other jurisdictions, because it wasn't ever part of the EU for services. Now that's changed. The UK has left the EU, and our chances of being able to participate meaningfully in global trade deals involving services, including financial services, are much, much greater. As of the 1st of January this year, the UK, or at least the UK excluding Northern Ireland, became free for the first time in my lifetime to negotiate its own trade deals in its own name. Further to that, the services trade barriers between ourselves and the UK, which existed because it was part of the European Economic Area, while we were not, declined markedly. What this means is that, assuming we can jump over the relevant and the proper hurdles which the UK sets for our participation, as well as coming under the umbrella of the UK's World Trade Organization membership. We can also ask to participate in new UK trade agreements with high growth countries where wealth and prosperity are actually being generated. Asia is already home to more billionaires than any other region, with 36% of the global total, and it's expected to see a 39% growth in ultra high net worth individuals over the next five years, the fastest growth in this demographic of any continent. What this means is that we are potentially, in partnership with the UK, able to enjoy better access into overseas markets for our services, for example our funds, than we were able to previously obtain. This access, of course, depends on us being perceived as a good and grown-up international partners. As Mr Bailey, the Governor of the Bank of England, laid out clearly in his speech of the 10th of February, this access, and he was speaking here on behalf of the UK, requires us to give up some control over our own standards and rules, because the alternative, a uh, narrow domestic control, is illusory. It would jeopardise achieving the very things we want, safe open markets and likewise open economies. The Commission seeks to help to ensure that Guernsey is regarded as an acceptable counterparty to important national trade agreements by ensuring that we are not just technically compliant, but effectively applying in a proportionate manner, ex international rules which govern how financial services firms which want to do cross-border trade must conduct themselves. To this end, we continue to be active in the working groups of 
the International Organization of Securities Commissions, the Financial Action Task Force, the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, the International Organization of Pension Supervisors, the Network for Greening the Financial System, the Global Financial Innovation Network, and the Group of International Financial Center Supervisors, not to mention the Group of International Insurance Center Supervisors. Thereby, we hope, we help to prove that we wish to and can contribute as a bailiwick to the global commons, helping to set out the standards under which international financial services trade can contribute to global prosperity. None of this is easy, but as we know, it's the victors who draw the national boundaries at the end of wars, and so it is with those who put the energy and the effort into the international fora to influence the rules through which modern financial services trade is governed. The changes caused by the international reaction to COVID are numerous, and they're going to be the subject of many speeches for at least the next decade. Today, I'm merely going to skirt around that vast subject and offer a few initial observations about the changes, which may be pertinent to the bailiwick in the relatively near term. Firstly, the bailiwick has proved in the pandemic that it's possible for its firms to do almost all their business with their international clients entirely remotely. Whilst no one, least of all me, particularly enjoys days of intensely draining video meetings, we have proven that international financial services can continue to successfully add value without much international travel. I would certainly not want to say that this could be a forever position. I know how much we all miss the physical interaction for which video meetings are a poor substitute, but it has certainly helped the bailiwick's IFC to be far more resilient than we had thought it could be when COVID hit in March last year. Catherine Jane will provide more details later, but suffice to say that, despite the pandemic, we still had 95% of the applications of the prior year in 2020, a testament to the resilience of the sector we're pleased to regulate. Secondly, the pandemic proved the value of having substance on the ground. Substance is, these days, important for tax reasons, but it's always been important for regulatory reasons, so we could provide assurance that there were real people doing proper things in a proper way in the bailiwick. The pandemic showed how substance was important for practical reasons too, connected with being able to continually service clients, when some outsourcing which had taken place to other jurisdictions was not necessarily 100% functional all of the time. I hope this enhanced recognition of the need of substance on the ground will con continue to contribute to high employment levels within the Bailiwick's International Financial Centre. At the Commission, we appreciate that there must be outsourcing, and indeed we encourage it in some areas where it can increase resilience. For example, good quality cloud service providers with strong financials and strong levels of internal resilience can certainly help smaller firms combat uh, crypto threats. That said, there needs to be a balance, and as no global norms evolve, we cannot see there being much future for jurisdictions which provide no more than tax advantaged brass plates. There has to be real value added in a jurisdiction, as there is under Guernsey's economic model. Thirdly, the nature of money has changed. Here I'm not talking about the latest fork in Bitcoin or some similar derivative that facilitates the illegal export of money from the People's Republic or the latest online ransomware to blackmail innocent citizens more easily. Rather, I'm talking about the unbelievably large amounts of fiat currency which the world's cent major central banks have electronically printed over the last year. As at the end of last year, we had seen the United Kingdom undertake an additional 450 billion of quantitative easing in response to the pandemic. The EU had done a further 1.85 trillion and the US a further 3 trillion and clearly Biden's gone beyond that since then. For the UK, this is more than double the amount of quantitative easing we saw in the immediate aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis. And for the EU, it is over 30 times more. The bailiwick is a very largely a buy-side jurisdiction. By this, I mean that it provides services for savers and investors. The big question for them will be what this creation 
this creation of a forest of magic money trees actually means for their long-term welfare. Some will worry about its inflationary effects, as inflation often benefits debtors rather than creditors. And some will worry about confiscatory taxation at the sort of levels of which the German constitution disapproves. This might happen as unwise souls make valiant, but ultimately self-destructive attempts to stuff the inflationary genie back into its bottle. The UK tried to do this with very adverse consequences for the well-being of its citizens in the 1920s, and I trust uh, big policymakers will take note of the, the disaster that was for the UK. The bailiwick's firms need to adapt to these new realities and help the entrepreneurs and the savers they serve navigate these inflationary currents through the rocks of fiscal distress to the hopefully calmer waters beyond. If the bailiwick can be seen to provide a port able to preserve and enhance the productive use of savings during the coming turbulent times, it can do a great service to many who have the intellect and the energy to drive the global economic revival. Turning to supply chains, the supply chains of major industries are changing and will continue to change. The pandemic has caused many otherwise apolitical people to become all too conscious of the threat that geopolitical tensions create for their supply chains. And many governments, caught short in terms of both PPE and vaccine supply, are likely to require much more national supply chain resilience going forwards. Building such national resilience will require major reinvestment in what were previously regarded as backwater industries, at least by us in the post-industrial West. Guernsey's private equity expertise should mean it can offer timely funding to the entrepreneurs whose rebuilding of large economies could help stave off 1930s-style mass unemployment in response to the changes in the economic landscape which have been accelerated by COVID. For our part, as my colleagues will elaborate in their presentations, the Commission has continued to refine and improve policy so the financial services sector in Guernsey can continue to evolve successfully. Fifthly and finally, and somewhat ironically, COVID has certainly brought forward the Green Revolution. Within the space of 12 months, such great industrial powers as the US, China, Japan and South Korea have all signed up to net carbon zero emission targets. This has left climate change sceptical business with almost nowhere left to run. In the bailiwick, we took a collective lead in 2018 on environmental finance through our Guernsey Green Fund. And our firms need to consider how they can best invest to help deliver the deluge of carbon negative investment these new climate change targets mandate across the world. And also, whether they should be taking measures to reduce or compensate for their own carbon footprints. For our part, by this time next year, we hope to be on our own way to doing so as we plant on this rather rugged bit of hillside several thousand trees, somewhere between 30,000 and 40,000 I calculated, as part of a physical long-term investment in real carbon offsetting, hopefully making us a, uh, uh, a net absorber of carbon by the middle of the 2020s. I'm now going to turn to how Guernsey can and should add value to the post-pandemic global economy. Much though I, and I'm sure many of you, much enjoyed living safely in our little Guernsey bubble during the summer months. I certainly gently sailing around Alderney and Sark um, was great. But economically, as you all know, we are one of the most interconnected finance hubs on the face of the planet, anything but a bubble. At the Commission, we are far from naive. And we know full well that some international actors and lobbyists seek to challenge our existence. Indeed, one might go so far as to say that many of them are so carried away by their own rhetoric that they probably sign up for global warming. If they could just be assured that the melting Arctic ice sheets would ensure the bailiwick was swallowed up by the ocean. There's a problem with them, that their case against the bailiwick is based upon a myth and a selfish, self-regarding myth at that one that is based on a flawed understanding of both economics and of human nature. It's to debunking this myth that I'm going to devote the remainder of my talk this morning. As we stand on the threshold of what we must all hope is a gateway to restored freedom built on vaccines, a freedom built on academic excellence 
and a strong public-private sector partnership, there is much which needs to be rebuilt. During the pandemic, many people have suffered, and for many of them, the pandemic countermeasures may well prove to have been much worse than the virus itself, as they have lost all that they worked for a lifetime to build. They emerged from the rubble with the business models upon which they and their employees have previously traded undermined, and with severely impaired cash flow with which to fund rebuilding and repurposing. In the minds of our detractors, we in the bailiwick are irritating, uh, irritatingly prosperous as a buy-side centre, um, and they seem to think that that somehow inhibits rebuilding, but we actually still have funds to invest when others have run out of money. Their thesis is built on a very false understanding that the world can only exist on a win-lose basis, that the size of the cake to be shared was fixed in ancient times at a preordained size. Their thoughts resemble, in an only a slightly modernized form, a Nietzsche-like struggle for the triumph of the will to power, and we all know where that ended. As the magic monetary economics of the global central banks over the last months has shown, the supply of money is not fixed, and nor is the supply of prosperity fixed. Indeed, since the early Middle Ages, technological and political evolution has shown that the supply of prosperity is far from fixed. Whereas in 1000 AD, almost anywhere in Europe, one would simply have been able to divide the people into warriors and tillers of the soil, with the odd priest thrown in for good measure. By 1300 AD, advanced societies with much greater culture and prosperity existed, following decades of much improved government with innovations such as the creation of prosperous monastic centers and universities. This has continued, albeit with the lamentable lapses caused largely by mistakes in governance, across our European continent ever since. The stock of prosperity is not limited. The bailiwick's prosperity is not someone else's poverty, quite the reverse. I'll repeat that because it's worth repeating. The stock of prosperity isn't limited. Our prosperity is not somebody else's poverty, quite the reverse. To take a relatively modern analogue, in 1997, when Hong Kong was handed back by the British to the People's Republic, despite it being smaller than West Sussex, it comprised 18% of the GDP of China. China was desperate to have it back, not just to close a chapter on the opium wars, but because it understood that the supply of prosperity was not fixed and how Hong Kong's commercial and financial expertise could supercharge its own growth, as indeed happened over the following 20 years. That this was the case was because for the previous few decades, Hong Kong benefited from an ideological, pragmatic, honest, honest and competent British public administration. That's worth, worth going over again. Hong Kong had unideological, un pragmatic, honest, and competent British public administration. Deng Xiaoping understood that and the value it offered to China when he took over from Mao and tried to inculcate a Chinese renaissance. Hong Kong Island, a rock almost exactly the same size as the island of Guernsey, helped turn around the fortunes of the world's most populous nation. Deng Xiaoping understood that prosperity wasn't fixed, but something to be generated by good quality government, combined with good quality entrepreneurship, by a hard-working and well-educated population. Guernsey doesn't operate on the scale on which Hong Kong once operated, but as the world seeks to rebuild from the pandemic, we offer many services to the rest of the world which can help it generate greater economic and societal well-being. We provide a secure home for patient capital. We all know that quarterly results, backed by business buzzword bingo, are not the underlying drivers of prosperity. Rather, patient capital is required to undertake long and experimental investments, which may take many years to show a good return. For capital to be patient, it needs to be secure. For who would invest if they thought the benefits from their risk-taking would be taken from them? whilst their losses would be merely their own. Worth reflecting on that. Who, after all, is going to invest, put your own money, your own capital at risk, if, if you uh, get it right, somebody will tax them away, um, but if you get it wrong, you'll just be left without your money. 
What the bailiwick provides is a such, just such a secure home, one that encourages such risk-taking for longer-term global investment. We offer a safe environment in which financial services firms can interact. After all, who wants to take risks with his or her money when it might easily be taken from them through an arbitrary sleight of hand, a might is right move by a competitor or supplier? Here are laws backed by well-attuned judges at the Royal Court and the Commission's Policing the Beat supervisory activities make that far less likely to happen than in other jurisdictions, whilst our enforcement activities should give other jurisdictions confidence that investments from the bailiwick are untainted. We offer a great, tax-transparent, low-bureaucracy environment in which to pool the funds necessary to take risks on big economic ventures. Relatively few other places can offer the expertise the bailiwick can pull together to gather funds and then deploy them on gainful real-world projects in a sensibly risk-adjusted way. Our detractors like to pretend that all the projects in which Guernsey's financial service sector invests across the world would somehow magically happen any, anyway if the bailiwick wasn't there to pull all the pieces together and to make the societally beneficial economic activity happen. That is more than a little tendentious. If we and our cousins in Jersey were not about to pull together capital from around the world in a lawful and pragmatic fashion, much investment and prosperity might well simply not happen. In the same way that there is not a fixed global supply of prosperity, there is not a fixed global supply of flour, yeast or baking powder to grow the pie. At a time when many decent individuals and their real-world companies will need recapitalization to recover, Guernsey's large private equity and private capital sector has considerable dry powder to deploy to grow the size of other jurisdictions' pies. Dry powder which there's no good reason to think others would be able to produce or deploy, as well as Guernsey. We also offer carbon-negative investment products and advantageous regulation for insurers seeking to make green investments to build a more environmentally secure future. Whilst others are thankfully also active in this field, given the trillions of pounds of investment required to make the Parish Climate Change Agreement targets a reality, we stand well prepared to more than pull our weight to help other jurisdictions move fast towards the carbon neutral neutrality which most scientists think would be strongly in our children's interests. What the Commission, alongside other local official sector actors, seeks to offer is much the same as that which a prior generation of British public servants offered the people of Hong Kong and the surrounding countries during the turbulence of the Cultural Revolution. Pragmatic, sensible, principled, but unideological British public service. At a time when too much ideological thought on both the left and the right seems intense on putting humanity into arbitrary groups who assume to be in perpetual conflict with one another, we treat people as individuals and we judge them on their merits. We believe in one rule of law under the Crown for all people, irrespective of their class, race, gender or any other supposedly defining characteristic. We don't care if you're rich, locally schooled, and incredibly well-connected. If you break the law and assist money laundering, rip off the vulnerable, and endanger financial stability, we will work with others like law enforcement to take rust, robust action to protect all the others who depend on Guernsey's ecosystem. Conversely, but it's actually a compliment, we are interested and receptive to beneficial technological innovations whilst remaining profoundly sceptical about pseudo-innovations surrounded by marketing buzzwords, which appear to us only likely to enrich the promoter at the expense of the retail investors who would be likely to lose their shirts. We are anxious to facilitate green investment, whilst being keen to avoid greenwashing by those out to make a fast buck at the expense of the credulous and the well-intentioned. In saying these things and making these assertions about how Guernsey contributes to the global commons, I'd love, for the sake of our common humanity, to pretend that we are nothing very special. Because if I were able to do that, then the lot of humankind would be much better than it is for so many in our troubled world. We are seeing tectonic plates moving in the global order. We are seeing many challenging and fundamentally unkind and unintelligent ideologies rampant in the face of these shifting tectonic plates. Here, we still believe and apply the enlightened values of liberty, progress,
tolerance, fraternity and constitutional government. We trust that both the business community and the much wider global citizenry who use their services will find our continued application of those values continues to enable human progress as those values have consistently done for many centuries. We may well get things wrong from time to time. Frankly, we've got no illusions of infallibility and at the Commission, we lack the thoughtless seal of the mindless ideologue. So when we do get things wrong, we like to think we can learn and get better. Further, we hope that we can through practical, effective, pragmatic public administration. Public administration based on common sense and decency help you. In this way, we believe we can continue to contribute productively to the Guernsey ecosystem, helping you to play your proper role, contributing to the rebuilding of prosperity in other jurisdictions in the wake of COVID. Thank you very much for listening.